Good morning. Uh, welcome to our service this morning. This is a bit different for me. I'm just by myself this morning. Um, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Uh, my name is Colin. I'm the worship coordinator here at Clearview Church. Uh, it's my pleasure to just welcome you into this service this morning. Um, before we begin, um, I guess as we begin, we're, we're already worshiping. We're already partaking in this service together. Um, I just want to... What do I want to do? You know, it's hard to, to do this every week. I miss people. I miss being together, I'll be honest. Uh, I'm sitting in my house alone right now. Uh, sometimes Ben is usually with me, uh, singing with me, but this week it's just myself. Um, and I guess that's kind of what this has been the last few few months, eh? Like, we've been on our own. Uh, we feel like we're, we are rogue Christians. We miss the community. We miss our church. You know, we miss, we miss our family, our people. Um, I miss coming together every week uh, and just hearing stories about how people are doing. Um, you know, whether it's like a formal kind of rep, like uh, presentation from the pulpit or uh, if it's just catching up with people uh, with coffee in our hands, um, I miss that. Um, you know, we weren't meant to do this by ourselves. Um, God has created the church for us to do this together. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard. Uh, but it's it's real. It's authentic. You know, we're meeting God uh, in in unique and different ways. We're making space to learn totally different uh, sides of God. He's such a big God. Um, but I, I don't know if you're watching this with your family or with friends. If you're in a backyard with some folks, if you're at the cottage, whatever that is, um, it's hard for us to imagine. But imagine how beautiful this looks for God. He's sitting there um, with this beautiful view of our whole church, uh, of, of churches around the world that can't meet together on a Sunday morning, but instead we are spreading this, uh, this song, we're spreading this praise across the world right now. Um, and so while we're not in our building, I pray that this is also you know, an opportunity for us to realize that we are worshiping God, we are joining in song together from all over the place. Um, I also recognize that singing can be very difficult uh, when we're not together. I miss, you know, the one big voice that we lift up together. It's easy to, to get lost in that kind of feeling in, the, in that song. Um, and for many of us, it could be hard to sing at home when you're by yourself or uh, when you're with your mom and dad or whatever that is. Uh, and so I'm going to give you permission for this song to not sing. Um, maybe you've been doing that already. Um, that's okay. Um, but this song, we're gonna sing it as a prayer. Uh, this is how deep the Father's love. Um, I encourage you to pull the lyrics up on your phone or on your laptop uh, and find those so you can sing along with me here. Um, but the reason I wanna do this song this morning is this came to me earlier in the week and I was thinking about what's all happened since COVID started. Um, I remember planning Easter um, and then have all of those plans just kind of thrown up uh, up, but um, dissolved, I guess, right? Um, and How Deep the Father's Love is kind of an Easter song. Um, it, it's, you know, this, we are remembering what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross, what it meant for God to send his son to die for us. Um, and a lot of us have felt death recently. A lot of us have felt loss, have felt pain. Um, but the story doesn't end there. The story that's, that's where it begins. That's where the, the goodness comes. That's where the joy comes. Um, and so I pray this morning that wherever you are, um, wherever you're coming from, um, this, is, this is a song that's going to unite us. Um, you know, it's called How Deep the Father's Love. Father, I pray that this can be a, a prayer that we're uniting um, together in. Um, 
not only our church, but uh, all the churches around Oakville, Mississauga, the GTA. Um, God, you love us so much, and I pray that uh, in these times that you can make that so abundantly clear for us. Uh, that we can offer grace to those around us. Um, that we can trust uh, our leadership and our government, God. I pray that you give us joy. You give us peace. God, I pray that you're lighting the path for us right now. Um, that, you know, we're not stuck in a rut, but we're, we're on a journey. This is just part of the journey, God.
Mm. God, I pray that we can live in that assurance. God, you have already won the battle for us. You've already conquered death. God, I pray that we can live into the joy and into the freedom that that comes with. That we're not living in fear, God, that we're not scared. But, yeah, God, we've got hope in you. God, there's so much going on in our world right now. We pray for peace, God. We pray for, you know, for justice. God, we think of, of um, you know, all the different things we're seeing on social media right now. Um, the things that have captured the attention of the news, that have captured the attention of media, God. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the line, God, break my heart, break our hearts for what break yours. So God, I pray that uh, you equip us with, um, you know, with humility to enter into hard conversations. Um, you equip us with courage to stand up for uh, for good, for justice, for, for what is true and what is right, God. Um, God, may we, may we see your path. Um, give, us, give us wisdom and give us discernment on, on how to follow you through this, God. God, you are so good, and your great love endures forever. Your faithfulness to us endures forever. Your love for us endures forever, God. Why should we gain from Jesus' reward? This I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. We are free. God, we thank you for that. May we live out in this freedom. May we invite others into the freedom that you offer, God. May we not be confined by restrictions. May we not be confined by loneliness, Lord. Um, yeah, God, we love you. We want to sing your praise. We want to know more about you, God. I pray for discipline. I, pr I pray that we can you know, see you in new and fresh ways. Um, God, invite us into your love. Hmm. Father, we're sorry for our sins, for the, the, the way we sin against you and, and our neighbors, Lord. Um, God, forgive us. Father, we're so excited for the time where our building can open again, um, where we can begin to gather on, on Sunday mornings, where we can gather on, you know, in different evenings and during the week uh, as, a, as a big church family. Um, God, I pray that uh, you continue to, um, you know, meet us in these online services as we figure out how to, how to host these gatherings. 
God, I, I pray for our staff and for our leadership, for counsel. I pray for uh, the decisions that have to be made. Um, God, I pray that, uh, you know, we're not pushing our own agenda, but we're being faithful uh, to where you're leading us, God. Um, and God, you know, our prayer is that uh, all of us will be equipped to take our next step in following you. So God, I pray for, for our leadership at our church. I pray that we can, we can lead well. Um, God, I pray for, for our entire congregation, whoever we are, wherever we are. God, I pray that you unite us uh, with your Holy Spirit. I'm thinking of a story. Um, I don't remember what it is. I'm, I'm, Jesus, where you, you healed, uh, I think a centurion comes and says, you know, my nephew or my niece is sick. And Jesus says, go, your faith has, has healed this person. Uh, and God, you've shown that you can heal, that you are active and that you are present from a distance. And so God, just like our, you know, our Wi-Fi is sending, sending signals throughout our house and uh, we're all connected. Um, I got, God, I pray that, that we can see that with you. Um, we can feel that with you. So God, help us to tune in this morning, this week. Um, you know, help us look for good, good service, good reception with you, Lord. Um, that we can hear you clearly. And Father, we pray this all in your absolutely holy name. Amen. Good morning, Church. This morning's offering will be for the Lighthouse Center, which is a Toronto-based Christian multicultural outreach and community center. I will let you hear more about their mission from Tabitha, their neighborhood program director. There are a few ways to give. You can give online, by text, by e-transfer or on the Planning Center app. Good morning, Clearview Church. I hope and pray that you and your loved ones are doing well during this very difficult season. Um, my name is Tabitha Eastman and I am the Neighborhood Program Director here at the Lighthouse Community Center. Today I will be sharing a little bit of an insider look into what we've been up to since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, how it's affected the work that we do and the people that we seek to serve. So like many, since the start of the pandemic, um, we've had to continue to provide um, emergency social services to those in need. Um, we did close our building off to the general public um, as well as our clients. Um, and we canceled programs that required direct in-person contact, um, contact within the building. Um, but we did continue to maintain um, and modify um, emergency social services and so some of those programs would be the food bank, uh, the income tax clinic, uh, psychotherapy, as well as support groups and we've had to modify them accordingly. So for the food bank um, how we've done it is that we've kind of set up the main floor as like a assembly line of sorts um, and we've done intake from the window and we've handed out um, hampers, pre-packed hampers through the front door. Um, we have seen God's provision and protection and support throughout this entire season and that has been really inspiring to see. Um, we have received a lot more food um, from a local grocery store, from Daily Bread, Second Harvest, and from supporters like yourself. One thing that we are very thankful for um, and we want want to say thank you as well to Clearview Church um, is just for continuing to pray for us and support us financially as well. Um, because of this COVID season, we have seen a 74% increase um, in food bank usage. So we looked at um, the start of COVID. So like from March till about the beginning of June, we ran the numbers and saw that there was a 74% increase in um, new clients coming in to use the food bank. So poverty is definitely a real struggle um, that many are facing within our communities, um, particularly due to this pandemic. Um, another thing that you can check out, um, I will make sure to send the link to leadership in your church, would be the COVID hunger report that Daily Bread put out. It's unique um, in that since the start of COVID, um, Daily Bread has been doing a lot of surveys and research 
um, on food bank users, and we've seen uh, a 200 percent increase in new um, food bank usage uh, across the city and the GTA. And so that has been quite eye-opening. Um, there's also a 34% of respondents saying that they will not be able to meet rent um, from three to six months from now, and that's also in the report as well. So definitely something, something to check out and be aware of, um, and just, you know, to keep yourself aware of um, what people are facing during these times and, and remembering our neighbors and our community um, and ways in which we can help. Um, of course, just checking in on your neighbors, mental health wise, as well as what people are in need of, supporting your local community centers and food banks um, are definitely needed. And so we thank you for the work that you already are doing and the prayer that we have def are definitely feeling um, and experiencing. Um, and so we just ask that you continue to support us in whatever way that you can um, as a community. And we hope and pray that you do well and that you are all healthy and that you are seeing ways in which God is moving in your community as well. So thank you very much. Have a great Sunday. Welcome to the sermon message um, portion of our worship service. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 119. Um, Psalm 119 actually ends with a um, prayer. I think Pastor Derek actually often uses this one as the prayer for illumination, where it talks about the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths being um, acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. And so as I finish reading Psalm 19, that prayer will be included as our offering and expectation that God will take his word and apply it to our lives. Let's hear and read God's word. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And the prayer. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we continue today our Apocalypse Now journey, thinking about this whole idea of apocalyptic literature, which often gets associated, as we've said a number of times already, with uh, catechism, cataclysmic end-time events when you know the world seems to be ending because so many difficult things are going on. And, and the church has, has made good on... Um, advertising those things, dealing with those things, getting excited about those things. Um, portions of the church just get really excited about the book of Revelation and connecting it with things that are happening in our world and predicting that this is now the end and, and putting fear into that kind of a thing. Today I want to emphasize a completely different direction of apocalyptic. So as we've said, apocalypse simply means revelation or in the verb form to reveal. And today what I'm really talking about is daily, routine, everyday apocalypse. So instead of apocalypse being those 
crazy way out cataclysm, cataclysmic kind of events. Apocalyptic is actually that which God shows us every single day of our lives. As the Bible says in a number of places, for those who have eyes to see and those who have ears to hear. So Psalm 19 talks really about two ways that God reveals himself. It talks about the heavens declare the glory of God, and it talks about the law of the Lord is perfect. And to simplify this or make it more memorable, I'm going to use two words starting with W. First one is world. The world reveals God. The world apocalypse is what God's truth is for us. And the second one is word, the word of God. The word revealed in Jesus, the word revealed in the Bible, um, apocalypse is God, reveals God to us. And this chapter, this psalm, if you look at it, is really divided into three sections. The third, third section, the W I'm going to use for that, is wisdom. The world and the word give us wisdom. And finally, we're going to end with wondering. Wondering what does it look like for us to take the world and the word, find wisdom in it, and what does that look like as we live that kind of a thing out? So first, the world. The heavens reveal the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they display their knowledge. And, and fascinating, powerful image that the world is speaking to us. The world is talking to us. The world is making us aware of that which is going on, and that which is true all around us. And I think that's a simple truth that we can really hang on to. Ecological disasters claim our attention and they help us recognize that if you spill oil in the ocean, then lots of animals are going to die, right? Global warming is another yelling of the world. There's also, of course, beautiful things that the world tells us when we look at the heavens, the stars, which is what is used in this psalm. We think of light years, whatever that can possibly mean in our minds. We think of um, the vast array of, of uh, spectacles and things that people have seen in the stars. We think of shooting stars and of comets. We think of the fact that we have now traveled to the moon and that we are now sending probes farther and farther into space. We think of galaxies, right? And, and just to be in awe of this amazing world in which we live, right? And that world speaks volume saying, Pay attention to how great and majestic and powerful and beautiful this creation is, this world is, right? And let that speak, of you, speak to you of your need for a humble understanding of what is your place in this universe and in this world. We are creatures in this universe created by our God. It's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words, I want to suggest to you that a live experience of creation, not just a picture of it, but an actual experience of creation, is probably worth a million words. Right? There are millions of words written about stars, written about waterfalls like Niagara Falls, written about um, the beauty and majesty of, of animals in their, in their habitat and all that, all that goes on there, and the amazing places that most of us don't get to see unless we get to see them on film. Right? This communicates to us Creation is saying to us, the world is saying to us, we need to be careful. We are caregivers. That's, our, that's the command of the word as well. We need to understand balance, right? There's a rhythm to life. There's work and there's rest. There's night and there's day. There's seasons for planting and there's seasons for harvesting. There's seasons of warmth and basking in sunshine and there's seasons of staying indoors and huddling around a fire and keeping warm. Right? There's a beautiful pattern in this world, including even the pattern of life and death. The seed must die in order for a plant to grow and all those kinds of things. Our awareness of this pattern built right into every aspect of this world draws us again and again to the creator, to the one who thought up and planned and put together this plan of a world where if it was just slightly out of balance, it wouldn't work the way it does today. And when I look at 
especially the things I don't fully understand in creation, when I look at some of the things that science can look into in ways that are amazing and astounding, when I look at the complexities of mathematics and those kinds of things, it always makes me just want to be in awe and wonder. And when I get out in the wild, and I'm able to canoe to a remote place to see way more stars than I can certainly see at home, when I'm able to just sit in creation and see a deer run by my path and recognize the beauty and majesty of this creature, right, and the many other creatures I've seen along the way, it just puts me in awe. It gives me pause to think, what an amazing world we live in. And what a wonderful God we have who's created this and invited us and made us to be part in tune with it. So that is the first book, and that's the book of the world. And I get that term, by the way, there's two books. I get that from the Belgic Confession, which is the oldest of the three Reformed Confessions. And um, it was actually written under duress by uh, Guido de Bray. He was actually a martyr for his faith. Unfortunately, he was a martyr within Christianity, if you will, because he was persecuted for believing what many of us believe about how the Bible should be interpreted and how we need to look at this. And um, he wrote this confession, Belgian confession, and the, very, and the second thing, the second article in it says, there's two ways we know God. First, through creation. It's actually the first book. And the second is through revelation of the word, right? So these two apocalypses, he doesn't use that kind of terminology, but um, these two revelations give us all that we need to know and understand about this world. It's striking to me as you read the rest of the Belgian Confession, he spends the rest of the time really dealing with things that are found in the Word and very little time, like one more article only on that which is found in the world. And I want to suggest that we often make that misbalance. And that's partially because, well, the Word is written and it clarifies its, its statement so we can right, interpret it and use it. But I want to suggest that I think we sometimes deny the power of apocalypse in the world, what it's saying to us, right? It's unfortunate in my mind that we as church have needed the world to tell us to get on the recycling kick, right? We didn't come up with that, even though our book and our world tell us we need to be in care and in balance with those things. And there's a few times where we've missed in the name of what we call Christianity, which is things that limited understanding of saving people, and we've missed that first book, which is God's world telling us, pay attention, you are part of this reality, and it's in that reality that you interpret the word of God um, for your lives. So the second thing then is, the second book is the word, the Bible itself, which here um, in verses 7 through 9 is given to us as um, sort of this ode to the law. Right? The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. Um, and it goes on for a few verses for six statements like that. And I suggest you that you take a peek at Psalm 119 at some point um, and look at Psalm 119 because Psalm 119 has one verse for every letter in the Hebrew alphabet. At least in my NIV, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet are actually listed there. And each of those verses has eight different words for law. Um, one per verse, right? One, one per stanza of that, of that um, poem. And it goes on like that. And Psalm 119 is actually best known for being what? The longest psalm, right? I was always happy if you're reading through the psalms when you're at 117 because that's all of two verses, right? And we're a little more hesitant when it's Psalm 119 because it's 176 verses. And if I may be so bold, of rather repetitive material, right? Because... Every eight verses has those same eight words in it, which are law, statute, et cetera, et cetera, those kinds, those kinds of terminology. And what that tells us is that the psalmist, he wanted to revel in the power of the law, the power of the word, the power of the truth of God, right? And let's be honest, there are times when our Bible reading feels like we're reading Psalm 119, where we're reading a lot of words and they seem rather repetitive and it may not be landing for us, right? Well, maybe for you, Psalm 119 does land really well. I'm speaking for me. But I assume for all of us, there's times where it feels a little dry and heavy and repetitive and difficult, right? But it's a recognition that we need to sit in those things, 
We need to allow them to wash over us. We need to commit some scripture to memory, to heart, to our mind and our soul at the same time so that they shape us and they guide us. Right In Psalm 119, as difficult as it is to read in one setting, is certainly stylistically a reminder of the power of that simple, actual truth. But look at some of the words that are descriptors of laws and statutes and commands and so on. They're perfect, they're trustworthy, they're right, they're radiant, they're pure, and they're sure, as listed in Psalm 119, 7 to 9. Those words, I would suggest to you, if applied to a person, make for one pretty awesome person. Think of somebody who's perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, and sure. And I hope the first person that came to your mind was Jesus. Because who Jesus is, is again, the Word. The Word incarnate, the Word made flesh, the Word embodied. right? And Jesus was all of these things because he is the one who came into the world as the Word, the truth, the law, embodied, right? And showed us what exactly does it look like to be in this world according to the word. Jesus tied those two things together and made them one in himself. You see, when Jesus embodied the law, he did so by using his own terms, fulfilling it, right? He didn't call us to be legalists, which is saying, well, at least I didn't hurt anybody else. Check if you've ever said that kind of thing. Well, at least I didn't hurt somebody. No, Jesus called us love everyone. Who is my neighbor? Well, my neighbor is that person you least wanted and assumed you needed to care for. That's who your neighbor is, right? So Jesus embodies in the world the very truth of the word so that we can see what does it mean to be in harmony with both of those things at the same time. And I think that's really what the third section, starting at verse 10 of Psalm 19, is all about. It's really um, recognizing the word in world terms. So they are more precious than gold. So the words are precious like gold, which is a world thing, right? A worldly thing. And they are sweeter than honey. And again, the word is made worldly in the image of honey. If I may, it's just a brief aside here. The two images here given in, in, the, uh, in verse 10, I... I hope they don't translate well from the Hebrew. I'm not enough of a Hebrew scholar to say that they missed it or something. They probably didn't. But it seems to me like such simplistic poetry, right? They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Um, yeah, just struck by, man, that's not the kind of poetry where you go, wow, they did an amazing job of picking new words. They just actually said the same words with a little bit more emphasis. But again, this isn't, always simply about are these fascinating soul gripping mind challenging words but are they and this is our question are they truths that penetrate who we are and ultimately then shape how we actually live right and i would suggest that, that speaks to sermons as well so i'm going to guarantee you that i don't always have and other preachers don't always have all the absolutely best words for something and that's okay. Not that we shouldn't try, but it's okay because what really matters is does the Word of God, as you live it out in the world, does that actually shape how we connect with neighbors, with creation itself, with God Himself, with each other, and all that we do? So we need to apply the truth to our lives. Pretty sure no one's going, wow, I never heard of that before. That is so basic. And I want to suggest that apocalypse is that basic. God isn't asking us to discern, boy, what exactly is going on in history and, and proclaim because I'm a Christian or because I'm a pastor, I know exactly what this means in history and it's this verse in the Bible. He really first and foremost wants us to love our neighbors. He first and foremost wants us to understand that what is spoken of in the word will shape how we can best live in the world. And as we've been thinking about lately, that has everything to do with being good neighbors. Neighbors to each other, 
neighbors in a healthy way in a COVID experience where we have to keep social distancing and care for each other in that kind of a way. Neighbors, as we think about racism, has, has come up in our news uh, since the George Floyd um, death, right? All of these kinds of things require that we say, not only do I know, do, not only do I ask myself, do I know the truth about life? Am I willing to live sacrificially the way Jesus did to put that truth into practice for myself and more sacrificially then for the lives of others? I want to suggest to you that this calls for a level of honest vulnerability, honest vulnerability that many of us don't easily go to. The Psalm says, verse 12, but who can discern their own errors? And most of us would like to answer, oh, I can do that. I know where I'm struggling. And maybe we can to some degree on the inside, but most of us need an accountability partner, an accountability word, the Bible, an accountability person, Jesus and his body, the church. We need other people who help us pay attention to that which maybe we've been vulnerable about and honest about, but have a hard time living into and living out, to, out as fully as we possibly can. You see, most of the issues that we really deal with are system issues or systemic issues. We're part of the systems that we're a part of, right? We're part of our family system, and so it's harder for us to see the craziness that's part of our family than it is for us to see it in someone else's family. Not only that, it's a lot more fun to talk about somebody else's system's dysfunction than dealing with our own, let's be honest. Same is true in church. In our church, we're part of the system. And so when we gather a group of people from a church and we ask those people to think about what are the challenges in their church, they're going to come up with the things that they know as people from within that system. But when you bring in an outside party, somebody to look at it from a distance, they often have some questions where you're going, why are they asking that? Because they come from a different system. They come from outside our system and they help us understand that we can't always discern our own errors we sometimes need a little more information, a little more light shed on to us by God and his servants who come from somewhere else. Same in our culture, right? The longer we are part of our Canadian, Ontario, Southern Ontario kind of culture, our GTA culture, the harder it is for us to see that we've actually bought into some stuff about this culture that isn't actually from the word. It's just simply from the culture, right? There are places where maybe we should say, we might want to be a little more radically different so that in our neighboring, right, we have conversations to have. We have wonderings to share. We have questions to ask about, is it really that important that we have one more thing? Is it really that important that my happiness comes, even if it comes at the expense of somebody else, some other people group around me or in our nation? Those are the kind of questions that the word challenges us as we walk in the world in the world right and to have the truth on that is really what i would call the third w wisdom wisdom is knowing how to apply what god says to us and put it into action in the very lives that we lead the word calls us out with questions like who is my neighbor it calls us out with things like it's actually better to give than to receive it calls us out with crazy thoughts like the last will be first. And it calls us out with this ultimate neighboring challenge. Forgive as I first forgave you, says Jesus. So as we think about this apocalyptic time, this time where God is revealing his truth daily, as he always has been, this apocalyptic time where the word and the world Convicts, uh, convict us of truths, where we've been practicing what does it mean to neighbor, where we're wondering, can we as a community challenge each other to a deeper sense of wisdom? And then can we wonder together? And I would suggest that you make this part of your daily meditation, this wondering, do the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart please you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer? Does the way that I live point to a God above such that in my neighboring conversations, the way I am in the world, my sense of being, 
as well as my words, the things that I say, I wonder, I ask. All that I am, does it bring glory? Does it bring attention to the God who created this world, who gave us the truth written so we may know how to live in it? And does it cause then others to wonder, where do these folks get a little bit of wisdom that they have to live in this world? And so, that is our prayer. That is our hope. That is our goal. That is what it means to be in community and to discuss passages like this, to discuss times like this, apocalyptic times like this, where it's not about the cataclysmic things going on around us that make us wonder if the world's going to end. It's actually first and foremost about the very basic things of life. What does it mean to love and serve the God of this world, the creator of this world? What does it mean to love our neighbors as ourselves? What does it mean to be the presence of Christ, to be the church in this world, even when we can't gather in what we normally call church, the worship experience on a Sunday morning? May God bless us all as we wonder, how are we doing in those things? And as we dare to take one more step in following Jesus out into that path. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as we worship you, as we hear from your word, we pray that you'd make us attentive to all that's going on in our world, in creation, in relationships, in relationships with each other, in relationships with people who are other than us, and in relationships with you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to help us discern, to challenge us, to send us out in the places where we must go, that we may gain and receive more and more your love, your power for our lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, for our plans for the fall. As we start to think about what does it mean to gather on a Sunday morning to worship, what does it mean to recognize that not everybody will be able to attend at this time, Lord, give us wisdom, give us compassion, give us the freedom to follow your creative lead in the places you really are calling us to go. And Lord, if those are a little more radical than just simply going back to what we've done before. Help us to be bold enough to step out and to discern where you've called us to be. Lord, as we think about ourselves as a church, we pray for our future direction. We pray for the visioning questions and the leadership questions, and we just pray that you would again give your very clear guidance there, that you would give us the humility to listen to each other and to you and to your word and to our world. And that you'd also give us the wisdom to step forward in faith in what you call us to do and where you call us to be. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll guide us as we engage with our neighbors. Again, lead us to places where good conversations can happen. Help us to be curious. Help us to be humble. Help us to take opportunities as you open them for us. And to recognize also when you've closed the door. Lord, help us to discern and help us to pray and to ask you, to guide us into each step of conversations with our neighbors. Lord, make us generous. Help us share what we have, what we've received, what we are, um, the abilities we've been given, the privileges that we have. Help us to share those with others and to do so in a way that's not condescending, but in a way that is loving, that honors the recipient and that shares life. And Lord, help us to be receivers as well and to be generous in our reception. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd continually make us mindful of our creation, your creation, the world you've given us to care for. Help us to be stewards, caregivers. Help us to be responsible. Help us to try and find that balance between caring for creation and, um, and ruling over it in such a way that it's used for productive means and purposes. Lord, give us deep wisdom in that. Help us, Lord, to continue attending on your word. Help us to find creative ways to read, to listen, to discuss, and to live out who you call us to be. Help us, Lord, to live as wisely as possible, to live in ways that also include letting wise friends speak into our lives, ask us meaningful questions, um, being vulnerable about where we're at, and also allowing you to guide us into deeper and further truths. And we pray, Jesus, help us to work hard when it's time for us to work and to rest fully when it's time for us to rest. Forgive our workaholism. 
forgive our shame around taking breaks and rests, and uh, help us just to receive from your hand all the different gifts of life, food and drink, busyness and quiet, energy and fatigue, day and night. And finally, Lord Jesus, help us to anticipate being sacrificial. Help us to expect that there's going to be a time in our life, a time in our day, a time in our week, when we need to give as you gave, to give our lives on behalf of others, to give our time, our energy, our money. And Lord, may we do so with a deep hope in our hearts for justice, not just for us, not just for those we know and love and are dear to us, Help us to have a passion and a willingness to be sacrificial for justice for everyone. And Lord, we pray especially for those who've been hurt and oppressed and marginalized. Right? Give us the boldness, the freedom, the trust, the hope, and the willingness to sacrifice to step into their lives as well and to walk with them on their journey, to hear their story, to pray with them and for them, and to walk the mile alongside of them. Lord Jesus, as you have done for us, may we also do for others. We pray this in your true, good, sure, right, radiant, holy name. Amen. I'd like to end the service again with the ending of Psalm 19. Because a blessing is meant to be God's gift to us that we may multiply, be fruitful, change the world, transform lives in his name. And so this is God's blessing to us. May the words of your mouth, our mouths, and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Go in peace and live according to to his word, in wisdom, for his world. Amen.